psychology and neuroscience of uh, olfaction, digital olfaction, and how we might use uh, digital olfaction in marketing or in um, a variety of real-world applications based on understanding how the brain works a little uh, and how the senses are connected. And it's very tempting when we think about the senses, when we have a device, uh, some sort of digital smell device that can deliver just to one sense, to think that's all we need to care about, just one sense. And certainly if we look on the outside, we have a nose to smell, eyes to see, a mouth to taste. All the senses have their separate uh, receptor organs, and they all initially at least project to different parts of the brain. And hence you might think, well, then it makes sense to think about designing uh, systems or thinking about well-being. We heard a bit about that earlier in terms of each sense in isolation. And that's been pretty much the approach for decades now. I just take one book here from Jean de Vries on well-being through the five senses. But it's a uh, layout copies what you see in any kind of psychology, neuroscience, uh, home design book, where we have one chapter for each sense. We're thinking about well-being, we're thinking about touch and massage, then we're thinking about aromatherapy and smell in chapter two, eating well, uh, what sort of music should you listen to. And then the book is kind of all over. There's only seven pages here for conclusions. What have we learnt by studying the five senses individually? No thought about how one sense might impact on any of the others. And for me and my colleagues in the sort of the psychology and neuroscience of multisensory perception, it's kind of the missing chapter or the missing book here that's of most excitement to us. And all the examples where when you study just one in sense in isolation, you tend to miss the bigger picture of our experience, which is always multisensory. It's always involving several senses at once, whether we realize it or not. And very often we don't. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not affecting your behavior, your, uh, your perception. So when the psychologist or the neuroscientist thinks about smell, I guess many of us now want to put it in the context of multisensory perception, uh, trying to understand where your smell brain is connected to, what are the rules that your brain uses to combine all the inputs of touch, of taste, of hearing, of smell, of vision, in order to predict if you're smelling this but seeing that, what will you experience, what will you remember, how much might you pay. Uh, and three of the rules that seem to come out of multisensory research are things like super additivity, the idea that if you have very weak sounds, weak visual stimuli, very weak smells and weak tastes, individually perhaps not identifiable or perceptible, when put together in a multisensory experience, could give rise to something that's much bigger than the sum of its parts, much bigger than the sum of its parts in terms of perception, brain response, single cell response. If we start playing with the senses and delivering something to your nose through digital olfaction that doesn't match what you're seeing, then the likelihood is you'll get some sort of suppression that the two sensory inputs don't match. Your brain does not like that. It's disobeying it's the brain's predictions, and you get a suppressed uh, response. And many examples of that from the marketplace, though quickly they disappear. Uh, and finally, the idea of dominance, I guess, is very important for the world of smell uh, from the work of the um, French sensory scientists and others showing a few drops of the red uh, odorless food dye can make the wine expert or the social drinker alike be convinced that they're smelling the red wine berries and not the buttery, lemony, uh, cat's piss kind of notes they were smelling a moment before with a, the same glass of wine that looked white. Exactly the same stuff going to your nose, but what the brain sees dominates what it experiences, what it attributes to smell. And so if you just think about smell, you, don't, you can't predict the experience of the organism you need to know what they're seeing as well and how the senses uh, interact. So that kind of causes some problems, I guess, in the, for the world of olfaction and for digital olfaction, in that you cannot study smell, deliver smell by itself, and hope to understand and predict what will happen. But in fact, uh, the brain combines all the senses all the time. We know some of the rules of combination, and now um, that causes problems in as much as whatever I think I'm delivering to the nose, whatever I think the person is smelling, will be modulated or changed by what they're seeing. Change the colour of the wine, change the smell you get. It'll be changed by what you're hearing. I'll give you an example of that towards the end. Of course, what you're tasting will change your flavour experience, what you think you're getting to your nose. And I guess probably, I can't think of an example, uh, but I'm sure changing what you feel in the hand could also bring to attention different elements of smell. So you can't understand smell in isolation. You need to know the rules of integration some of which being revealed by the neuroscience in order to better predict experiences uh, and behaviours. And smell's always going to kind of lose out in this, in this battle of the senses, I think. We've known that for a long time here from an advertising book from 1950. 
plotting the kind of the vividness of the imagery you can get through stimulating in marketing communications, one sense or another. Uh, visual, very vivid images, auditory, pretty good. But the one that loses out here, olfaction, it's hardest to create a vivid image uh, for use in advertising. Or well, think of it another way, where smell also loses out. This is from a uh, highly created Sensorama, one of the first, I guess, sort of digital smell, multi-sensory devices. Uh, thinking about the order in which senses capture our attention. Very often, it, there are lots of things out there, but unless we attend to them, we won't perceive them. That's the gorilla in our midst, for those who've seen it. And here we see, according to Halig, um, vision being the predominant capturer of your attention, of your brain's resources, of your awareness, followed by hearing, and, and he thinks smell comes in thirst, third. Whether that's right or not, I'm not sure, but I think we'd all agree it's not in uh, the top two. Or think of it another way, and again, smell comes out near the bottom of the list of our senses. If we think about the amount of brain given over to processing what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we um, feel, then to the best estimates of the neurophysiologist, 55% of our brain is given over to processing what we see, uh, but very little to smell and taste. The bit rates for information transmission by smell and taste, so low as almost to be uh, inestimable and way, way lower than what any of the other senses can contribute. And hence, it's always going to be the other senses that dominate in most situations. In most, but not all. And I guess the challenge is to find those situations in which olfaction does win out, where it has a competitive advantage against the other senses. And that's not going to be in the um, judgment of where things are, because we can't really tell where smells come from so easily. It's not going to be in the judgment of when did things happen, how rapidly did they change. Hearing will dominate there. But smell maybe can dominate for repetitive judgments. If I would show you a beautiful food we had for lunch today, if it smelled off, you'd never touch it. No matter how beautiful it looked, no matter how much the steak sizzled, if it smelt off, you wouldn't touch it. So smell can utterly dominate our other senses, even with a, slow, with a, with a low information capac carrying capacity. And the question is, where else can we use smell or digital olfaction in order to modulate, to slightly change, to enhance the experiences delivered by the other senses? And I think there are examples uh, where... When I change what you smell, uh, I can change subtly what you see. When I change what you smell, of course, it'll change the flavour of foods again in, in tastes. If I change what you smell, it'll change what you feel. And probably, if I change what you smell, it'll change what you hear. These effects might be more subtle in this direction, given the smaller amount of, uh, kind of information processing capacity and attentional capacity of smell. But they exist, and those are the ones that perhaps one might want to focus on in digital olfaction. Uh, modulating the experience of the other senses rather than creating something totally wonderful just through the sense of smell itself. Um, and smelly off fish isn't particularly fun to work in, but what, are, what, what other places do we see a modulatory role of smell? They could be everything from kind of the most expensive uh, product you might ever buy, a kind of a Bentley, is that a quarter of a million pounds, or a Rolls Royce, uh, Silver Shadow. Uh, and when those cars go back for their servicing, you spray a little bit of the uh, 1955. It's silver cloud, silver shadow, Rolls Royce smell, the wood panelling, the leather, spray it in when the car goes for a service and the owners come back saying, this is brilliant, what, what have you done to my car? It's like, it's like a new car. It's just amazing. A large part of that change in their experience is just through a little bit of smell, nothing more. The most expensive thing you could ever buy and that slight addition of scent can create a huge amount more value in this product and I think all the way down uh, the scale. Elsewhere, where you see the addition of scent, just giving that little bit extra, is in kind of virtual reality simulations, be it if you're with Laura Croft down in the dungeon, maybe the swell of sweat might bring something to the experience. Or if you're playing war games, um, you might have the brilliant, the best visual technology, the best auditory technology, but it just doesn't smell like war, because smell, war smells pretty bad. Uh, and add that smell in to, uh, for military simulations or for battlefield surgeons, who are going to have to be operating in very difficult, very smelly conditions, then you need to add the smell in to get the experience, kind of the sense of presence and the experience as close to the real thing as possible. And here from this great audiovisual um, VR, then the killer touch is, if you excuse the pun, this generator pumps out the smell of cordite and the, uh, the odour of dead animals. And that really puts you in the war field uh, better than anything else. The other senses have to be there, they have to be good, but you get, a, for a small addition of scent, a big increase in uh, presence. Um, and that might be the, the, the way to look 
uh, not to have two grand aims, I think, for digital or faction. Um, I can see another example of this, uh, colleagues who work in Germany who have the most expensive driving simulators, 20 million euros worth of driving simulator. It makes all the right sounds, it's got more pixels than you can count, but it doesn't feel like driving. And they tried around, they tried impro improving visual resolution, tried everything they could think, until somebody came up with the idea of the two euro plastic fan, and as the car simulation goes, it goes faster, you just blow this plastic fan a bit faster, and suddenly you're there, you're in the open-topped car, can feel the wind, and that's maybe what the smell can give, the very cheap uh, intervention, potentially cheap intervention, that delivers a big hit um, to the others. And while we don't work with um, uh, military simulations, or if we did, we, I couldn't tell you about it, uh, we do more of our work just in kind of consumer markets, thinking about how smell and digital olfaction could be used uh, to help companies uh, in a variety of domains. And we've worked with Firmly, Shividan, Unilever, Quest, I don't know if they still exist, I guess not. Takasago a lot at the moment. Uh, and increasingly with sort of independent perfume manufacturers like uh, Roger Dove down here, who sell some of the world's most expensive perfumes uh, that are taken out of context. Uh, our subjects say this, like toilet cleaner. <laughs> 3,000 pounds worth of perfume in a bottle. Uh, so it's all, all the everything else there. Um, but we work across the spectrum trying to help uh, these individuals and companies think how they can use digital olfaction. And very often that comes in terms of claim support. What is it that adding fragrance gives to the consumer experience? Uh, here, at one example from our eight-channel olfactometer that's not as big as the big olfactometer that we saw this morning, nor as small as the very small olfactometer we saw uh, even earlier in the day. It's kind of a suitcase-sized, uh, home-built eight-channel. Now we can work with people like Unilever uh, and fragrance houses, showing that when you think you're feeling uh, the touch of the fabric you're clothing when it comes out of the wash, say, if you add the right fragrance, it'll feel softer. It'll look whiter. It's not physically whiter, but get the smell of whiteness, and you can deliver something beyond what your competitors do are doing. And you can use the neuroscience and psychology to sort of uh, most robustly and rapidly do claim support, because that's what the psychology is good at, measurement science, really, but measuring very tiny effects in the most uh, robust and replicable uh, manner, and used through sort of digital olfactory displays uh, here. Or another example, maybe if you're thinking about sort of digital marketing, what might uh, adding uh, olfaction give? If you're down in the dungeon with Laura Croft, or if you're looking at beauty products, then the sort of thing we'll have here is a um, little nose cone with the cables to the olfactometer, eight channels of smell, people rating women on the screen, say like this one here. Periodically faces come up, you have to rate them, um, and then periodically there's a smell that is presented uh, to you. And maybe you're asking something like, how good-looking, if you're a young woman, you come in, how good-looking is he? Pretty good, on a scale of 1 to 10. Uh, how do you make that judgment of, of beauty? It's all about what I see. Does the smell influence you? Of course not. Does it influence you? Of course it does. Uh, we give you a whole database of less attractive, more attractive faces, and then occasionally the smell of links or some other a pleasant, proprietary, future perfume. And we can show that young ladies will rate him as about 10% uh, more attractive than if he smells like B.O., synthetic B.O., or if he smells like Greek goat, <laughs> which we have in a bottle as well. Uh, and then you're thinking, well, maybe he doesn't really look more attractive. I don't believe it. Uh, maybe people just come into your lab and if you want to get another five pounds for a study, they say all the things you want them to say. But if we bring the young ladies in, lie them down, stick them in the brain scanner, then we can see in the parts of the brain that code physical attractiveness, parts of the uh, lateral orbitofrontal cortex, as you add the fragrance, uh, you see a shift in the blood flow and the activation that perfectly maps on to what you see when you just present an ugly or an attractive face. It's kind of an attractiveness line, if you will, in that part of the brain that smell modulates. So it's a real low-level perceptual effect that people deny. Of course the smell isn't affecting my judgments. It's all in the eye. No, it's not. Don't believe what people say. And while we've looked at attractiveness, others have looked at likability. How much do you identify with a person on the screen? That can be changed by smell. Whether you're even aware of the smell or not. Nice work from Lee and colleagues showing that even a subliminal presentation of odour has the biggest effect on how much you like someone you're seeing. Do you think it's a man or a woman? Again, uh, smell can ha have an effect. As on effect, as on sympathy, as on ageing almost any dimension, will show some modulatory effect by adding the appropriate or the inappropriate fragrance. And we can use digital olfaction, the techniques of psychophysics, uh, to make support claims there. 
Or maybe even uh, if we're thinking about uh, online shopping, there's a lot of interest there, what we could get extra through smell. Uh, one project we're working on at the moment is thinking about uh, use of smell to direct visual attention, either in store or online. You've got all these things you could look at. Which one do you look at? Well, imagine yourself at the greengrocers, you smell the strawberries, and where do you look? You look at for the red things. So you could release scent in order to bias visual search, perhaps, and get a slight uh, competitive advantage there. And a lot of these sort of uh, FMCG companies are very interested in this because they know how much fragrance plays as a key differentiating factor for their products, be it shampoos or whatever else. That consumers tell you smells such an important part of why we chose that brand. Add more fragrance. I guess it's P&G uh, fine and people buy more of certain categories. They say it's important to their decision making and yet you've lost it online. You can't deliver that smell. Uh, so what can you do? Or if you're a, a retail, we saw VF earlier on today. Uh, and we've been working with them as well, thinking about uh, fragrance in stores. They're worried that they have a good or bad store experience. Uh, some of their stores have a certain scent. Uh, they're increasingly thinking about digital uh, shopping for their clothes brands. They've lost the smell. How can they bring it back? Especially when you see something as simple as this. The smell of a uh, bowl of flowers will increase purchase intent in some uh, studies by 80%, increase the value you describe to a pair of trainers by $10. That's something you'd like to capture, keep for the online shopper and not lose when, they, when people switch from the high street uh, to the internet. Um, I couldn't resist putting this back in. We've heard about the inspirations for the, for the digital olfaction uh, in the case of packaging and, uh, and, and soaps and so on. And this is my own one, I guess. Uh, this is my grandfather's shop in uh, Idle Bradford. And he knew a thing about smell and smell marketing the manipulative side, I guess. It's meant to be a greengrocer's or so, we were told. Look inside and, in fact, it's all spirits. Apparently, there was a ham and there was some other stuff there. There was not just spirits. But he would walk around behind the counter with the expensive coffee beans on the floor. And when people came in, what would you like? Crunch, crunch, crunch. Out comes a smell of coffee. He found, by trial and error, that it works. It's not digital olfaction, but it is use of olfaction for marketing ends that has the ring of the slightly manipulative about it. And that's perhaps what we want to avoid. We want to enhance people's experiences, not just make them uh, buy more. Um, but maybe we could think, if not in digital marketing, uh, in other cases where the addition of smell might have a more easy to justify beneficial effect on the end consumer or on the driver. And lots of interest here around uh, scent displays for drivers. They've got the uh, hi-fi, they've got the CD player. Why not have a little smell control device either to help them relax if the steering wheel or the car decides that they're stressed, to mask the smells of the city pollution, or perhaps to, as you're driving through the countryside then, if you're going through the forests, what better than the smell of the pine forests to really enhance that multi-sensory driving experience. And I've heard that some of the car companies, what they would ideally wish for is that when you get the car home, park it in your driveway, you just sit there, turn the engine off and just sit. Because they've created such a wonderful multi-sensory atmosphere in the car, you don't want to get out and have your dinner. You'd rather just sit there and enjoy, smell, uh, listen to and feel uh, the experience. And smell will be a part uh, of that. Um, but I think there's going to be problems here, not just the problems of the brain, that we have low information carrying capacity, processing capacity for smell, but also problems of technology. We've seen some solutions to that already today. Uh, I mean, there are things like the sensor armor that was around since the 60s. It was mentioned there was various examples of fragrance in cinema and Rose Bowl and elsewhere earlier. Um, and we see there, it's kind of, they get smaller. Um, this one from 2011, kind of smell display. But they're not on the high street. They don't seem to carry over somehow. And what's the problem here? If smell could have such a great effect on immersion, on, 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 say, on shopping behaviour, then why doesn't it appear on the high street? Well, it does on occasion. We've had the scratch and smell phone over in, a, in the Far East, launched in 2007. But it feels more like a kind of a temporary marketing job because you can't really buy, as far as I can tell, smelly phones these days. It was a one-off, probably triggered by the sensory marketeers saying you must get as many touch points as you can. Why not introduce smell and differentiate yourselves? And we've sort of been here before as well. I can remember 10, 15 years ago, and DigiSense was around. They were telling us the future was smell, uh, USB smell sticks and the rest. And then they went under. Um, so something's just not, there's some disconnect there between the potential of the smell and what actually happens in the marketplace. And there are odd kind of nice examples, like for the last World Cup, the, the USB stick you stick in that has the smell of the freshly mown grass. Uh, so you don't need to worry about the kind of the smells coming and going. 
But again, it's kind of a one-off thing. So I think the real worry here is even if you had the technology that was small enough, portable enough to put in a mobile phone, say, how would you ever convince the consumer to buy the refill? I'm not sure you ever can. How do you convince people when they say beauty is all in the eye, it's not in the nose? If we don't know how the importance of smell, how do you convince people to pay for the cartridge? Um, and also, even if we had the technology small enough and portable enough and we had consumers willing to pay for the refill, would it even happen then? I could think about this, this sort of laptop here, and it's got a loudspeaker. It's a crap loudspeaker. There are lots of better loudspeaker technologies out there that could be put in this. But for some reason, we just want the visuals. And nobody seems to think about putting a better quality sound in a laptop. And if they can't convince us to do that, why think they could convince us to uh, put smell in there? Uh, I don't have the answer. But on, on a f final note, uh, slightly more positive, I want to think about what you can do uh, in a kind of a creative context with smell and music, and this is a big part of our research efforts at the moment. Going back to um, Septimus Pierre's one of the earliest, with the kind of the scent organ we heard about Aldous Huxley a bit earlier, I guess probably inspired by uh, Pierre's talking about scents like sounds appear to influence the olfactory nerve in certain definite degrees. There is, as it were, an octave of odours. Like an octave in music, certain odours coincide like the keys of an instrument. Very strong association there between olfaction and hearing he creates his own, his own kind of mix of um, uh, odours to go with notes. And the question is, is there any truth in that? Was it true in 1820 but not today? Uh, if there is a truth, how can we build on it and use it to create multisensory experiences that are fun? And this kind of language of smell and uh, music is there since the 1820s. Uh, and this is where we think things might be going. Kind of a sensory app that we worked on uh, with Corbusier uh, indirectly at the end of last year. We have a complex odour, I guess probably as complex as wine, I don't know how many aromatic things it's got in there, but uh, a lot. You can break it down to the top six, so uh, ginger biscuits, coffee, creme brulee, candied orange, iris flower, uh, and something else. People can't really articulate that smell, break it down. What we do is give people the smells of the components of candied orange, creme brulee, and ginger biscuits, and then give them music that has been composed based on correspondences, a bit like the ones that Pierre's identified. Uh, we test people in the lab, we give them the smell of candied orange. They pick notes, they pick instruments. Then a composer makes some music to match that uh, taste or flavour, aroma. Here's another piece of music designed to go with a creme brulee. You might like the music, you might lock, might not. There's always kind of a science element and then the design on top of it. Um, and this for... Uh, the ginger biscuits. And so here we've got this kind of correspondence between odours and aromas, between aromas and uh, notes and instrumental tracks, uh, that people can go online, play the music. At the moment, the smell comes from scent sticks, but it would be nice to digitise that. And they can try it and see whether those bits of music really do match the aromas they were supposed to. And then once they've paired each aroma with the music, you can then get them to drink the cognac while listening to this, which has all three elements. It has the ginger biscuits, it has the creme brulee, and it has the candied orange. And hopefully the experience of having the elemental parts then sum together and create an experience that we can't articulate when we talk about smell, but by linking it to sound and music, we can uh, help to enhance uh, real uh, experiences. I think that's probably a big part of, uh, of the way forward for us, especially since, in a way, we just see so how much interest there is just in the general population when they start talking about these synesthetic almost mixes between uh, odours and colours, that odours have shapes, that smells have sizes and textures and elevations and hues and roughnesses. There's so much research still to be done there uh, to document just how real these synesthetic correspondences are and then think how to use them uh, with the aid of digital olfaction to create kind of experiences and apps that people want to play with and th through so doing get enhanced experiences of products and brands. I shall finish there.